Testament's primarily written in Hebrew. The New Testament's primarily written in Greek. But the Aramaic part is the one that kind of lets us kind of get hung up. We go, well, where is the Aramaic in the Bible? Well, you're looking at it. The name Bartimaeus is Aramaic. I've never paid much attention to that, okay? But let me give you just a little bit of a background and a history lesson so you understand what's going on here because for me, this made the story come alive all afresh to me. And this question that Jesus asked even had more depth to me when he asked the question. So the name Bar, right there at the, the first part of Timaeus, this is Aramaic name, and the word Bar means son of, okay? Son of. And so the Bible goes on to tell us that it's the son of Timaeus. And the name Timaeus is also an Aramaic word that means blind man. Interesting. He was the son, a blind man, the son of a blind man. That's telling us something about this story that I've never noticed before. This eye sickness that this man had where he was blind was not something he'd picked up. It wasn't some kind of disease. It was not some kind of contagion that had gotten in and affected his eyes. It was genetic. It had been passed on generation after generation after generation. That makes this miracle even more amazing, doesn't it? He healed a man in the story that had never seen anything. He had nothing with which to reference it. He, he, he'd never seen the faces of his own family. He, he'd never, as he sat begging every day, he'd never seen the colorful tapestries of people walking by. He had no idea what people even looked like. Think of that. He'd never seen the blue of the sky. He'd never seen the grass green or, or, or the color of the trees in the fall. He, he'd never seen anything. He was born that way, and it was genetic in their family. And we're told as we kind of move on in this passage of Scripture, and this is so amazing, that because of that, he set begging. Now, interesting about this, we don't know where his family is or what's happened. Perhaps he's been put out of the family because they couldn't take care of each other. Maybe the whole family or a family of beggars. We don't know. All we know is that because of his blindness now, he's been reduced to sitting by a roadside every day begging. And that's how he survived every single day, sitting on the streets of Jericho, spreading out his cloth, anything someone might throw at him in the way of coins or, or, or money or, or gifts, that's how he was able to survive every single day. Verse 46 now says, When they came to Jericho, Jesus and his disciples, as they went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging, begging. That's the picture that we get of him in this passage of Scripture. Blind Bartimaeus. Listen, and when Jesus passes by, I mean, we read this all in Scripture, Anytime Jesus passes by, miracles are possible. Anytime Jesus shows up, miracles are possible. Now, I want to just stop there for a second because that will preach to me. Because the Bible says that where two or more are gathered together in his name, where is he? What is right there in the midst of them, right? You got it? Is he here? He's here. He's here. And if you're listening on the live stream, listen, he's there too, right? We're gathered in Jesus' name. He's right there with you. That means miracles are possible. Miracles are possible. And when Jesus says to you, what do you want me to do for you? He means it. Now, here's what I want to do in the little bit of time that we have here in this passage of Scripture. And, and I don't want to prolong this or, or make it too long for you this morning. I, I, I think this message that God has laid on my heart has stirred me at a point because within myself, I can find Jesus asking me this question. Buddy, what do you want me to do for you? As I wrestle and I struggle and I try to make sense of things and even as your pastor, sometimes I don't know what to do in situations like this. I've never done this before, right? This is a new one on me. And I'm like, God, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. And I can hear him saying, buddy, what do you want me to do for you? And right where you're sitting in your situation, whatever you're going through, perhaps he's saying the same thing to you. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want? For some of you, it's family issues. For some of it's personal. For some of you, it's health. For, for some of you, it struggles with all of this, just like it is for me. It's, it could be any number of things. And, and I can hear our Lord out of his love, out of his graciousness for us, out of his care and concern for us, just like he had for this blind man that people pass by every day and never even looked at. 
just like for him, I can hear him saying to us, what, what do you want me to do for you? So here's what I want to do. It's hard for me to think of this question of Jesus without seeing more questions in it. I mean, when I look at this, I see more questions. I think there's some things he's probing in this. And anytime Jesus asks a question in Scripture, I think he's probing deeply. I think he's digging deeply into us. And so here's what I'm going to do. Here's your points this morning, okay? I'm going to give you three questions that I think emerge right from this question that I think we need to be asking ourselves, okay? Here's the first one. This one comes right from the question itself. Jesus asked this question of blind Bartimaeus as he passed by him in verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? For the first question is this. Here's point number one. What do you want? What, what do you want? That, that's pretty powerful. What, what do you want? Again, I believe that Jesus is asking each of us that same question. He asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Now, what would you like for the Lord to do for you? What is it that you need him to do most for you? Is there a situation in your life where you need a miracle and you need it now? Jesus is asking that of us. What, what is it? What do you want me to do for you? That, that's a question that he asked Bartimaeus. Now, let's think about that for just a minute and kind of dig into it a bit, kind of pull it apart. I think on Bartimaeus' part, there was this recognition, right, of the acknowledgement of the Lord's ability. Whenever, I think whenever Jesus asked that question, what do you want me to do for you? I think God saw something in Bartimaeus that said, listen, Bartimaeus has a need here. And, and I love it. And, and you say, well, how do you kind of see that in this passage of Scripture? Well, when you read it, when this man discovers Jesus is passing by, I don't know if you noticed it, but he lost it. Do you see it? Re read the passage. And you'll notice in this passage of Scripture, this is how I know that Bartimaeus had this need, and he heard Jesus say, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus, from the very beginning in this story, it's like he heard Jesus is coming, and he literally lost it. Now, now look at verse 47 and notice this. And when he heard, Bartimaeus heard, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's like he got all excited. He got all fired up because here's what he recognized. Something inside Bartimaeus says, this is my hope. This is my chance. This is the answer. And, and I love that when you see this because, listen, he hears the commotion going on. He hears something. Perhaps he grabbed the, the trim of someone's robe and he said, who is it? Who's passing by? And that person said, it's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And all of a sudden, Bartimaeus says, hope began to rise. Have you ever heard that song, Hope Rising? Hope Rising. That's a, a great contemporary song, Hope Rising. I don't know about you. But I think right now is a time for you and I as Christians, as believers, and as a church not to lose hope, but for us to see hope rising. I believe we don't need to be down-in-the-mouth Christians who are wringing our hands over the things that are going on right now because our God is on the throne. He is mighty, He is awesome, and there's nothing going on that catches Him by surprise. And I think if anything within us there ought to be a hope rising that God is on the move, that he's up to something, that he is passing by. And when he does, he's going to say to us, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want? And listen, I'm going to tell you, listen, this is what I believe. And, and listen close to me. I believe that right now we need to be praying the same thing this man was praying. Listen to, what, listen to how he prayed. And he began to shout it at Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You want to know how to pray right now? Underline that in your Bible. What do you want? Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Who, who is the merciful, gracious God that we serve? Him. Who can solve the things that you and I cannot solve that are going on in our world right now? Who has the answers to that? Him. Right? Who, who can bring healing to a nation? I'm going to tell you, it's not what party's in office. It's not. Who can bring healing to a nation? Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. And I believe that Christians ought to be praying that. 
We ought to be praying that in the midst of this election. We ought to be praying that in the midst of this pandemic. We ought to be praying that in the midst of the things that are permeating our culture right now, the unrest and the rioting and the tension that we see happening. We ought to be saying, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And I'm telling you that when Jesus passes by, and that's our prayer, he will heal our land. And as believers, we need to be crying it out, crying out to him with that prayer. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. I love that. Do you believe, I mean really believe deep inside, do you believe that God can do what he said he could do in his word? Do you believe that? You you see, I think that's a huge thing for us to consider. We we say we believe it. We kind of give kind of an admission to it. We kind of say, yeah, I believe God is big enough. I I love the benediction that Paul gives in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. When Paul makes this acknowledgement, and I love this, and I think about it all the time, in Ephesians 3.20, I love this scripture. He says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Think about that. Do you believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think? Do you believe that? Then we need to be crying out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. I think Bartimaeus believed that. Now let's kind of go on and look at it. Listen, God is, was not too small for Bartimaeus. Look at verse 47. It says this, And when he heard that it was Jesus now, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and notice he's crying out with that phrase. And then you kind of read on in the story, and you will soon discover that people began to try to silence him. They tried to quiet him. And what did he do? He cried out all the more. When I read this passage again this week, preparing for this message, God laid this on my heart. When I read this, you know what? Here's what happened. We've cried out, we've cried out, we've not seen the answer, we've not seen it happen yet, so what have we done? We've let it silence us. They said, hold your peace. Pipe down. Quiet down. Shut down, right? They've said that to us. And you know what we need to do? Same thing Bartimaeus did. Cry out all the more. Cry out all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And he will. He will. We can see it in the story. I love this. So the first question is, what do you want him to do? What what do you really want him to do? Bruce Wilkerson, who wrote that great little book that's already become a Christian classic called The Prayer of Jabez. Remember that book? Bruce Wilkerson says this. That's how you know the name. But Bruce Wilkerson says this. Simply put, God favors those who ask. He holds nothing back from those who want and earnestly long for what he wants. I think we need to be asking. We need to be petitioning. We need to be crying out. You see, here's what I know about my God. My God loves to show mercy. How do I know? Because he showed me mercy. My God loves to show grace. How do I know? Because he showed me grace. How do I know that when I cry out to this God and I say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, that he will do so because he loves and wants to pour out his grace and his mercy on people that he loves. And he loves. He will do that. So we need to cry out to him. So first question, you kind of get it. What do you want? Here's the second one, and this one probes a little bit deeper, and I think it comes right from that question. This one more implied, but, but here it is. You need to think about this. Here it is. Number two, what do you want me to do for you? Well, what will you be willing to do to get it? What are you willing to do to get it? That, that's a great question, isn't it? When you hear Jesus saying to you, what do you want me to do for you? I, I don't know that he's really saying that, but I think within our mind we go, you know, how, how much do I really want that? What, what am I willing to, really willing to do to receive what he wants to do in our land, what he wants to do in my life, what he wants to do in our church? What am I really willing to do to receive what he wants to do in my life? Now, now, now listen, it's one thing to say, this is what I want from God, but it's quite another thing to say, this is what I'm willing to do in order to receive it. You see, I believe that God all the time is offering to bless us and pour out in our lives, but we're not willing to humble ourselves and come. We're not willing to be broken before him over where we are and our struggles and our failures. We're not willing to come to him on his terms. I think that's a big one. So so look at it. Jesus asked Bartimaeus in verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus' answer is really interesting. He says, Rabboni, 
It's intensi- that's an intensified form of the name rabbi, but literally it has emphasis on it, my Lord. And I think when he said that, it was almost a surrender of his life to him. My life is in your hands. Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. That, that's interesting. And it's a no-brainer, right? He's a blind man. He wants to see again. In other words, Jesus said, Lord, I want to see. I want to have my sight back. He wanted his sight back. He wanted to be able to see. And what's really interesting, now read the story again sometime, and this leaps off the page at me. It speaks to my heart right now where we are. He was literally willing. He wanted what he wanted so badly before the Lord and believed that Jesus could, that he disregarded public opinion and threw aside all social norms. Now, now let me say that again. Notice in the story that he wanted so badly what Jesus could do for him that he disregarded public opinion and he threw aside social norms to get it. Do you think we're ever called on to do that today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you go, well, where, where are you getting that in this passage of Scripture? Notice verses 47 and 48. Look at it with me again. Here's what it says. And when he, Bartimaeus, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. So, so, so what's he doing right there? He's going to disregard public opinion and social norms because here's what it says. But he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 47, we read that when he heard that it was Jesus passing by, he cried out with everything that he had. And others warned him or tried to silence him. And what did he do? He cried out all the more. So what's he doing there? He's disregarding public opinion. Now, let me just tell you something as a Christian. What you believe and stand for as a Christian is not popular. It's not politically correct, right? It's not PC. But I'm telling you, listen, we've been talking in the past several weeks as I kind of preached this series on being balanced between truth and grace. I'm telling you, we must not forfeit the grace of God, but we also must stand firmly on the truth of what God's Word says. And you and I need to understand that's not always popular. It's not always easy. There's going to always be those voices that are going to try to silence that. But what are we to continue to do? Cry out to Him all the more. You see, you and I must not be silenced When we're coming before him, we must not be silenced by public opinion or by social norms. And you go, well, where are you getting the social norms part? Well, now listen to to this. I want you to see this in this passage. He wanted Jesus so badly that he was literally willing to go against the crowd, right? To go against what everybody else was telling him to do. And they kept telling him to be quiet. But but that's not all that happened in this passage of Scripture. It's very powerful. If you go on and look at verses 49 and 50, look what happens there. It says this, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then he called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. I don't know if you noticed that in verse 49, but it's interesting. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's, he's, he's calling you. I, I love those words right there in that passage of Scripture. Jesus stood still. Here's what God kind of showed me about that. Just as I'm praying over this passage, kind of wanting to kind of bring this to you this morning. I, I, I just kind of meditating on those words. So Jesus stood still. Here, here it is. Jesus never ignores a hungry, hurting heart that cries out to him. Never. I, I, I don't know where you are right now, what you're struggling with, but, but, but I love this. When you cry out to him, here's what Jesus says. He stops, he perks up, he pays attention. He never ignores the cries of a hungry, hurting heart. He doesn't. He never walks away when someone is crying out for his mercy. He stands still. He hears. He sees. He helps and comes. He heals. He blesses. And Jesus commands Bartimaeus to become to him. Look at verse, verse, verse 50. And I love this too because it's something else he was willing to do. It says this. And throwing aside his garment... He rose and he came to Jesus. Now, this is very interesting and very illustrative when you kind of study what's happening and the scene that's taking place here. Now, we said that blind Bartimaeus, genetically born blind, he sat by the roadside in Jericho begging every single day. Now, we know, according to tradition, that there was a way that they begged. He would have worn the regular tunic of the day, but perhaps his clothes were tattered because he was a beggar. He also would have had wrapped around him a cloak, and that was a very important garment for him because it's how he kept himself warm at night. 
It's what covered him and protected him from the elements of the weather during the day. If it was hot, it became a shady tent over him. And as he sat begging, begging, he would spread it out on the ground, and people who gave him alms would throw it on this cloak. His alms would be thrown there. And when he heard things hitting that cloak, he was blind, remember. He would gather the four corners up and collect what was in it. That cloak represented his ability to live and survive. But what was he willing to throw aside? His very life. All that he had. And and, and I love that. So in this question, what do you want me to do for you? There's this question, what are you willing to do to get it? What are you willing to do to get it? And here's the third question. You ready? I got about 10 minutes to hash this one out for you. So stay with me on this. I want you to see this one. Such an important question. You ready? Number three. What would you do with it if you got it? We're crying out to him. I'm going to tell you right now, as Christians and as a church, we don't need to see these days that we're living in as times of despair. We need to see these as times of opportunity. Opportunity. I believe that God wants his people and his church to be a voice pointing back to him. A voice of hope. Remember hope rising, right? A a voice of encouragement. A a word that draws others to him. Now, Now, what would you do with it if you got what he what you're asking him for. When Jesus says, you want me to do, what are you going to do with it if you get it? What, what's going to be your response? Remember, Jesus is asking that question, what do you want me to do for you? I have little doubt about the fact that the blind beggar Bartimaeus knew exactly what he wanted, right? I want my sight, but now what's he going to do with his sight once he gets it? That's an interesting question for me, and it's a question that probes my heart. Buddy, if I blessed you in the way that I'm desiring, to, what you're asking for, what are you going to do with it? What's that blessing going to do? How are you going to use that blessing? How is how I touch you, the miracle that I create, when I begin to work and move in your life, what are you going to do with that? And and I want you to see this in this passage of Scripture because I think this is so interesting. Notice we've read all the way down to it. Look at verse 52 and notice this. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. He healed him. A man born blind, genetically blind, he gave him his sight back. Now, here's what I'm thinking. I got my sight. I got a million and one things I want to do. The rest of my time on this earth, there are things I want to see, places I want to go. I want to go see my family. I want to go, I want to go out on the hillside. I want to watch the stars come, the sun go down and the stars come out at night. I want to watch that. I want to play in the grass and I want to look at what I'm playing with. I want to begin to experience all of those things. But look at verse 52. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight, and look at this, and followed Jesus on the road. What did he do with what God had done in his life? Did he run out to the hillside and wait for the sun to go down and the stars to come out? Did did he run to play in the grassy fields that he'd never seen before? Did he run home to his family? No. What did he do? Follow Jesus. Folks, that's beautiful. I, I got to tell you, when Jesus passes by, he wants to do something in our life. I'm telling you. But the question is, wh- what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Now, let me give you a couple of possibilities here that I think emerge from the story of what we can do with what Jesus has done in our life. Because, listen, for some of us, we know right now God has already done a miraculous work in my life. He saved me. What am I doing with what he's done for me? He cured me of spiritual blindness, right? I was born in sin, and he saved me from my sin. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see, right? You got it? What are you doing with what he's done for you? Let let me give you two suggestions here, two possibilities. This is kind of the close of this, okay, guys? Two possibilities of what you might do with what Jesus has done in your life or will do in your life when you answer this question. Number one, would you, like Bartimaeus, let what God gives you result in a, in a, in a closeness to Jesus, closer than you've ever been, in a drawing near to him? W- would you, like Bartimaeus, let what Jesus has done in your life cause you to move closer to him, closer in your walk, closer in your fellowship, 
than you've ever been. W- would you allow that to happen? You go, well, where are you getting that? Well, Bartimaeus, it says, follow Jesus. The word followed there means to accompany. It's the idea of being in the same way with. That's literally what the word means. It means he was in the same way with. Here's what Bartimaeus did. He didn't run off. What did he do? He wanted to draw near to Jesus. He wanted to get close to Jesus. He wanted to stay near him. I believe that he became a part of those in the entourage who followed Jesus everywhere he went, including to the cross. I I believe he became one of those. There was a closeness created there. And I think that for some of us right now in our life, what we need to do more than anything is draw near to him. The Bible says if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Let it create a closeness. And then second... What are you going to do? What are the possibilities of what you're going to do with what he's done in your life? Let it create a closeness. But second, would you, like Bartimaeus, let what God gives you result in a commitment to Jesus, a commitment to follow him? I like the phrase, if you look at it there in verse 52 of our passage, and I think this is very um, interesting. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. And see that phrase, on the road? Follow Jesus on the road. That means literally he hit the trail with Jesus. He hit the trail with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, listen, whenever Jesus does a work in our life, what ought it cause us to do? Draw close to him, and then we ought to get on fire and hit the trail for Jesus. Hit the trail running. We ought to begin to give testimony of what he's done in our life. We ought to begin to praise him. We ought to begin to realize and understand all that he can possibly do for us. Now, I'm going to just kind of state this and kind of say it again. I love this passage of Scripture. One of the things I love about it is the simple question he asks. What do you want me to do for you? And and I have no doubt in my mind this week I've heard him asking me that hundreds of times this week. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I'm going to tell you, every single time I've heard the question, I've felt the answer. Every time. And if you and I in our life will just begin to be like blind Bartimaeus, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't don't know how to handle these things. I don't know how to make sense of this. We'll hear Jesus, a still small voice whispering in our ears saying, what do you want me to do? And we surrender it to him. I can promise you you'll find the answer every time. Would you bow with me for a prayer?